Okay, thanks. Uh, first of all, my thanks go to conference organizers and to all the efforts they put making this possible. Well, uh, during my presentation, I'll address how other um, legitimate factors referring to non-scientific factors have been taken into consideration in the regulation of food safety risk within the uh, SPS agreement and the Codex Alimentarius Commission. Moreover, um, at the end, I will also try to give you some additional reflections on any possible uh, impacts on, of COVID-19 in this sense. So, um, since the uh, 1970s, GAT started to develop uh, a set of rules to distinguish legitimate from illegitimate restriction in global market in the domain of non-tariff barriers. In 1994, with the adoption of the Agreement on the Application of Sanitary and Phytosanitary Measures, rules on science and risk assessment, uh, even in the area of um, food safety, came into play. So according to the SPS Agreement, uh, the harmonization of uh, food safety measures um, with standards um, um, can be done with the standards developed by the Codex Alimentarius Commission, which appear to be the best candidate to fill this role. Um, in both cases, so both within the SPS agreement and both within the activities of the Codex Alimentarius Commission, the paramount for legitimacy is scientific knowledge, in the sense that it is considered as a sort of normative yardstick. Um, Against this background, uh, the issue of a sort of innovative approach on risk assessment has been raised. So the point here is to uh, in include the possibility that economic, social, environmental or sustainability aspects um, came under the scope of trade rules and under the multilateral scientific consensus. So here a question if the legal and institutional framework of these uh, two bodies and pieces of law are responsive to this emerging problem at stake. Um, so CODEX, uh, which is a jointly international body created by FAO and by World H.O., um, started in 1995, so just one year after the adoption of the SES SPS agreement, to consider working on principle conserving the role of other uh, legitimate factors. In 2001, Codex members adopted a decision on the criteria for the consideration of other factors, and which are the, the most important aspect of this, uh, of this decision. First of all, uh, other legitimate factors uh, can be related to both health protection, but even for faith trade practice. Second, risk manager should indicate uh, how these factors affect the selection of risk management options. Then the separation between risk assessment and risk management should be respected. And the factors uh, should be accepted only if they could be considered on a worldwide basis, uh, while for regional basis they can only be accepted if they uh, are adopted for regional standards. Moreover, they should be clearly documented, including the rationale for their integration, and even on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, the relevance of this factor should also be considered in relation to possible impacts for developing countries. And last but not, not least uh, is the fact that uh, the only factor which has been properly identified as a proper other legitimate factor for risk regulation is uh, uh, economic uh, uh, interest, um, which in every case should be uh, substantiated with data. So uh, more than uh, other legitimate factors in this sense, we can state that these are sort of rules that can be followed in order to identify which are any other possible uh, legitimate factors for risk regulation. Um, and states were aware of the fact that in the COTEX context, uh, risk analysis has to be considered more as a health issue with trade implication and not as a trade issues with, with health implications. And so uh, if we want to sum up on the um, position of uh, codex in this sense, we can say that first of all, there is a sort of legal basis 
in order to consider these other factors because it has developed the, um, uh, this decision in order to identify them. But then from an institutional point of view, uh, if we look at the mandate of Codex, it basically has to adopt uh, international standards, guidelines or recommendation um, with the aim to protect consumer health and with the aim of fair trade. And thus it is not probably under its scope to consider this other legitimate factor. And last, if we look at how the adoption of international standards concretely is practiced within the COSEC, we can say that standards are basically uh, adopted in subsidiary bodies where the main actors are just scientific experts. Um, then if we uh, look at the WTO framework, uh, first of all, in the text of the SPS agreement, there is no reference to risk management, but only to risk assessment. It's, it is a, um, it's a very debated issue, um, both by academics, practitioners, and so on. And if we look at the text of the agreement, we can say that in Article 5, which is, one, which is the one devoted to risk assessment, in the paragraph 3, there is only reference to relevant economic factors. And the same provision is also contained in the Annex A, where within a definition of uh, um, risk assessment, there is just reference to economic consequences. Then, if we now look at, uh, um, at the case law uh, within the WTO, there is a, a very famous statement in the Appellate Body Report in the AC Communities Hormones case, where it was stated that risk assessment under Article 5, Paragraph 1 is not only risk assurance in a science laboratory operating under strictly controlled conditions, but also risking uh, human societies as they actually exist. The actual potential for adverse effects on human health in the real world where people live and work and die. Um, so why here we have a specific reference to the fact that uh, risk assessment should not be considered as a sort of isolated uh, framework at the same time with not a proper reference of what are those specific legitimate facts and in which way we can use them. And um, by the way, there were other two important cases which related to this aspect in which are namely Russia peaks and also Japan apples, but in this case, no proper guidance on these aspects were developed. Um, an important uh, point uh, which, is, which can be useful to identify other relevant factors has been developed within the activities of the SPS committee, which in 2000 um, adopted guidelines to further the practical implication and implementation of Article 5.5. Uh, and in this sense, there was a specific reference to traditional food, which um, may imply the acceptance of a lower level of uh, protection. So in this sense, we can probably consider that both cultural and religious aspects that can be related to food can be taken uh, into consideration uh, when uh, risk manager or popular, more popular risk assessment is developed. Um, if we then look at the relationship be between the World Trade Organization and the codex standards, as we know, the WTO does not uh, Probably adopt directly standards, but only decide to adopt the standards that have been adopted by the codex. So there is this sort of specific reference within the agreement in Article 3 devoted to harmonization. And um, at the same time, we know and also states are aware of the fact that the credibility and reliability rest on codex operating within uh, its mandate which is based, uh, as we say, at the very be beginning on scientific foundation, but even also on procedural requirements. Um, so in this sense, uh, there, is, uh, there is no a sort of uh, hierarchy among the SPS committee and the codex. And at the same time, there is no uh, a proper form of controls or cooperation between these two bodies. And so at the end, yes, the SPS committee should not attempt to influence the procedures or decisions um, 
of the adoption of international standards by making reference to any possible uh, other relevant international, fact international factors in the development of risk assessment. So again, if we want to sum up on the uh, WTO position and other uh, relevant factors, in this case, we can say that there is no reference to risk management in the SPS agreement. And of course, this is a quite um, a relevant obstacle um, for the aiming of um, identify these possible factors. Moreover, there is only reference um, only to economic aspects, while no uh, social, environmental, sustainability factors are considered in the text of the agreement. And at the same time, there is no form of proper control or cooperation over the codex. And this is due mainly for legitimacy reasons. And so some factors that can be relevant according to the WTO framework uh, cannot be imposed on the uh, activities uh, of the development of the international standards within um, the Codex Alimentarius Commission. Um, at the same time, it is possible um, to identify that there is uh, some possible area of intervention within the SPS committee, as the guidelines that I previously mentioned demonstrate. Uh, but since now, um, no proper results uh, uh, were given within the activities and um, the activities of the SPS committee. And I believe that the two main reasons um, of this lack uh, are due to both the institutional characteristic of the WTO and, on, and of course, um, it's due also to its mandate. And uh, in this sense, it is well known the general debate about uh, trade and non-trade concerns and how um, the activities of the WTO should be limited in this sense. Uh, finally, I would like to look at some of the measures that have been adopted by states uh, in relation to uh, COVID-19. And if among these measures and all the reflection that we made in this sense, there are some possible inputs for, um, for the issue at stake. Um, first of all, during the last uh, uh, month, uh, a lot of uh, measures have been notified that to the WTO Secretariat, and among these uh, national measures, around uh, 20 of them were related to uh, um, provisions on food. Uh, but um, basically, um, all of them provided just restriction on import and exports, and were just related um, in order to guarantee uh, the food security within uh, in each uh, state's border. At the same time, there, there has been an interesting uh, um, interim guidance provided by FAO and World Age Hope of, um, um, of last week, uh, um, which was directed to competent uh, um, authorities which are responsible for food safety control. Um, in this sense, first of all, uh, this guidance uh, tries to address which are the challenges that now national authorities uh, which are in charge for risk assessment and risk management are addressing, especially for the consequences of COVID-19. And so in this sense, the challenges can be, um, um, can be related to uh, basically the reduced capacity to maintain the fully functioning of food safety inspection program, uh, to the reduced, reduced capacity of uh, testing in food laboratories, to the increased risk to guarantee the supply chain, of course, in this sense, all of the risks related to food security. And finally, they need to respond to an increasing number of questions from ministries uh, for the food industry, but even consumers and, uh, and media. In order to, to tackle this, uh, this challenge, um, the measures that have been suggested by this guidance are basically in two different directions. First of all, they suggest to adopt and introduce electronic data in order to guarantee uh, risk assessment and risk management um, measures, even in this uh, period of emergency. 
At the same time, given the lack of possibility to access to laboratories or the lack to uh, workers um, to, um, to, to circulate within each country or, or even in some, uh, in some cases to cross some national borders, um, this interim guidance suggests also to consider the activities of private bodies in order to develop a proper risk assessment or risk management. Um, so, um, generally, the, uh, um, the kind of um, measures that have been adopted both at national but even at international level suggest that science and scientific experts are sort of, have a sort of leading role uh, in uh, this uh, particular period of emergency. But at the same time, there is also a call for a prompt and decisive reply and, and of uh, political actors. And uh, more generally, we can say that public actors are again at the center of, uh, of the public debate, even in the international arena. If we now try to pinpoint which could be the um, possible impacts of COVID-19 um, in the efforts to try to identify other relevant factors for a proper assessment of, um, uh, of risk uh, measures, we can say that a lot of public fears that uh, arise in, in different countries cannot be considered as a sort of other factors that uh, legitimate the adoption of a risk assessment measure in the sense that, um, for example, there has been a, a call in the European Union um, not to um, legitimate the request for COVID-free labeling because in some countries uh, like Greece and other East European countries, there was a request some, from some importers to uh, guarantee uh, that these products can be considered as COVID-free, but that all of the measures and all of the statements that have already been um, explained before me uh, demonstrates that food cannot be considered as a possible transmitter of disease. All of these uh, measures that have been required cannot be considered legitimate, and I would say not under the WTO framework, but at the same time not under the Codex Limitized Commission. 